couple of questions about uh, some examination that you had done of uh, Dakota Van Patten's phone and information from the download of that phone. Do you remember that? I do. And you remember that I asked you if you were able to locate a phone call on his phone? I do recall to, that. In a phone call to Melody Hoffman's phone that would have taken place on February 17th, 2024? I do recall that. Yeah, were you confused by that question? I was. Okay. Um, have you, um, is there some clarification that you'd like to make to your answer to that? There was no phone call that night. Okay. And regarding that, um, that answer you gave, did you also do um, an examination of Mr. Luisma's uh, phone and uh, phone download information to try to see whether there was a, a phone call that was still there of, that was made from his phone to Melody Hoffman's phone on February 17th, 2024. On the 17th, yes, there was no, there was, I, let me correct myself. There was no phone call that day. However, there was one on the 18th at approximately 10.30 p.m. I believe there was two phone calls that were made to Melody's phone from the defendant's phone. So your examination showed on the defendant's phone there was a phone call made to Melody Hoffman's phone, but that was on the evening of the 18th around 10.38 p.m.? That's correct. Okay. And that there was actually two calls made then? Yes. Okay. Is that why you were initially confused about that answer, that you had found a phone call, it just it was on Mr. Louisman's phone and not Mr. Van Patten's? That's correct. And then before we move on to the next uh, set of questions, I want to revisit that exhibit that's already been received in the evidence. We don't need to put it back up, but um, it was just received, uh, number 17Y. It's that Snapchat photo that was on Dakota Van Patten's phone. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? I do. Okay. And because some of us may not be familiar with Snapchat and how that works, um, maybe, can you explain how somebody would take a photo and then how they would enter in numbers into that photo, like how that would be done in a way that would be consistent with producing what's in 17Y? Yes, so Snapchat is um, an application that you can put on your phone. Um, it's primarily used for making pictures or videos. They have different filters. Um, you can add text. Um, a user would open the application. It will bring up generally your uh, camera, and then all you have to do is click a circle at the bottom of your phone. It takes that picture, and then there's editing tools on the right-hand side that you can select either adding text, uh, emojis, uh, GIFs, whatever it may be, and you can add that text. So like the 5917, you can type that in, and then you can either manipulate it to be diagonal or large, small, whatever you'd like, and you can, you can manipulate the, phone or the photo in any way you'd like. So in regards to 17Y, uh, was there a background uh, photo of any kind or it was blurry it's uh it's indistinguishable but it's it's dark would that be consistent with just pointing the phone at something dark or something up close that wouldn't result in the image just to get a photo made correct okay so once once that's done then does the individual have to access a text function then to edit or modify the photo yes you would have to take the picture and then you would go to I believe it's a little T to add the text. You click it, and then you type in whatever you'd like, and then you can then manipulate the text itself that way. So in this case, um, the user would have to put 5917 in. Correct. And when that, do you, do you have to push a button to populate that to the photo then, or does it automatically do it? It would, after you type in the text, it automatically places it onto the photo itself. Does it automatically place it in the position where it would be enlarged and diagonal across the, the photo? Generally, no. It's uh, just a smaller text size that pops up on your on the picture itself. You would have to manipulate it to be a larger text and then at an, at an angle. Would that require then uh, additional hand manipulation to open it up, enlarge it? Yep, some kind of finger yep. manipulation with on the phone itself. Okay. And then what do you have to do to complete that process? Uh, you can either send it to somebody or save it. Uh, there's various ways that you can, what you can do with the photo. So you have to stop the editing. Is there a done button for that or something? Or no, there's no done button. You can, there's um, a little arrow at the bottom right hand corner that you can send it to people. And then I think in the bottom left hand corner, it's, I think it's a download symbol. So the box um, with an arrow and then you can save the photo.
And then after doing all that, you can save the photo in a manner that it appears in 17Y. That's correct. Okay, now we're going to pick back up here, I think, about where we left off. Um, okay. Um, Sergeant Peterson, did you conduct some follow-up investigation on some information that was gathered from Defendant Louisma's phone involving some uh, health data um, that was taken at the approximate times he was at uh, Morgan Creek and um, at Lily Pond? That's correct. And what kind of uh, information was in that health data that you had access to and then performed the um, follow-up investigation? The, there was two, like you stated, at Morgan Creek and Lily Pond. There was two um, sets of data that was uh, documented. It was meters and uh, for distance and then steps taken at different uh, times for both locations. Okay, so the phone recorded within the health data um, meters in terms of how far the phone traveled? Correct. But then also steps kind of like our um, Fitbits and whatnot? Correct. Okay. And so did you have access to um, how many uh, steps uh, were indicated that were uh, taken, that was recorded in Mr. Louisma's phone? Let's start at Morgan Creek. At Morgan Creek, I believe it was around 32 steps. Okay. And what did you do with that information that you had? I, uh, myself and Investigator Pope drove out to Morgan Creek uh, where the Life 360 uh, indicated that they parked in that first parking lot. Um, when we first responded out there, we found some yellow stains in the parking lot we thought were interesting. So I started by walking from that uh, parking space on the south side of the parking space or parking lot and then used the sidewalk to walk to the pavilion and then I walked back. And when you did that, uh, were you able to record how many steps you took? Yes. And what do you remember as far as the steps you took? It was approximately 40 for myself. And um, did you do anything in regards to the meter information at that time? I used a hunting app that I have, and it, it tracks your GPS location. And when you start the track, it will pick up your phone's location, and then I walked, I, I hit the track, and then it tracks you to wherever you end the track. So when I did that, the, the GPS tracked me at 32 meters approximately. 32 meters was what was tracked during your experiment there. And Correct. What do you remember in terms of what um, Mr. Luisma's phone showed in meters? I believe it was 36 or so. 30. 36. Did you find, uh, as a result of your uh, follow-up investigation at Morgan Creek, that the amount of steps that, that you had to take and the meters involved in um, taking those steps from the near parking space to pavilion to the pavilion area and back was consistent with what was in Mr. Louisman's phone? Yes. If we could um, present to the witness what's already been introduced into evidence in States Exhibit Number 11C. Asking to publish that? Yes, and publish it too, Your Honor. Publishing 11C now. Now we have 11C up on the, the TV here. It's not up on the big screen quite yet. There we go. Does this help demonstrate at all the area where you measured the number of steps that you took from the parking lot to the structures in the area? I did. It does. Can you, can you show us if you still have the laser pointer up there maybe? I do. Um, just kind of what step, steps you took to find, make these conclusions. I actually started at the parking lot where this vehicle is, or the parking space, I should say, where this vehicle is, at where the driver door would be, 
and walk this way and follow the step or the, the concrete to the pavilion itself to the to the to the table that's under the pavilion. And so when you did that and then performed the walk back, that's when you found the, the consistent information between what you did and Mr. Leesman's phone? Yes. And just based upon your knowledge of uh, how this health data, data is, is collected and the number of steps recorded, is that going to record just that movement and that um, location change as far as health data? As far as I know, your phone feels you walking and then it, it can track how far you're stepping. And so in your experience, is that going to include anything, that, any other movements you might make once you're in one position, like uh, waving hands or anything? No, like that? no. Okay, um, one second. Okay, now, now Judge, we're going to uh, show the witness what's been previously marked and introduced into evidence as State 6A. And so number 6A is up right now, Sergeant Peterson. Do you recognize that? I do. And what does that depict? This is uh, Lily Pond Park. Okay. Did you do a similar follow-up investigation at Lily Pond Park? I did. Um, that you did at Morgan Creek Park? I did. Um, and was that regards to the information that was recorded in Mr. Louisman's phone in terms of steps and meters and, um, and, uh, and follow-up on that with conducting your own investigation? I did. Does this area help demonstrate the area you measured in terms of steps? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us or show us with your laser pointer kind of w what you did here? Uh, so we parked in the parking lot approximately right here, and then we walked the a route that um, we believe that would have been likely towards where Melody's body was located right here around this big tree, um, noting that it would have been dark and it would probably have been easier to see that direction. Uh, the, the steps could have been in that general direction, but that's the route we took. Um, and then while standing at um, where Melody's body was found, I had a laser rangefinder um, and shot the laser back towards my truck to get the, the range from that location to my truck. Now that's line of sight, and it doesn't account for um, any deviation while you're walking, but that is line of sight, and it, it turned out to be 65 yards on my laser rangefinder. So you found that roughly the distance between the uh, parking lot area there to where Melody's body was found was approximately 65 yards. Correct. And again, that's not accounting for maybe some divots or other land type uh, you know, layout here that might account for that. Yeah, it would not account for any kind of uh, deviation from a straight line. And then um, what else did you do while you're out there? Um, the distance that was recorded, um, I believe it was nine minute difference between the first set of steps and the second set of steps. The first set was approximately 320 uh, steps, and the other one was 270, if I call correctly. The distance, though, was 185 meters and 181 meters, um, respectively, with the 181 being with the 270 steps. Uh, due to how far away the uh, Melody's location was at in the parking lot, we also moved further east towards the bridge over here to see where it might be the next closest location a uh, vehicle would logically park. Um, if the photograph would depict the road that um, Lily Pond is on, there's a driveway or a street that leads into an RV park, and that's the next closest um, location. And it was well over a hundred and some yards f just from the, the bridge itself eliminating them parking from at the uh, intersection and likely parking at the, the park itself. Did that help you then um, more closely focus on the area where you wanted to conduct the further exper experimentation? Yes. So what we gather here from you there is that there were two, you said there were two sets of um, movements that were detected? <coughs> That's correct. And those movements were nine minutes apart? That's correct. And is your testimony then that the first set involved, um, did you say 320 steps? Approximately 320, yes. And that information, and the specific information, is going to be in the report itself? That's correct. This is based on your memory of That's correct. 
and that that involved that 320 steps involved uh, did you say 185 meters that's correct okay. and then there was a second set of steps correct and how many steps did that involve approximately 270 okay. and that was nine minutes later yes okay. and so that involved 270 steps and then how many meters 181 and so based on those numbers and the location that you um, conducted this experiment from, what kind of opinions or conclusions did you draw? That the first steps, uh, the 320, were likely walking out towards where Melody's body was location, or where her body was located, then walking back, and then for whatever reason running back to that location and then back to the car wherever they parked. The, the difference would be the stride length between each um, of those steps of the, the distances. That's why there's fewer in the second set. So the meters are roughly the same, but the steps in the second set are less, and in your opinion, that's consistent with the longer strides of a run? Or jog, something moving faster, or longer strides, that's correct. And so could that be running towards the location and running back? Yes. Could it be walking towards the location and running back? Could be. In any event, it's an indication of uh, longer strides, but same roughly distance. Same. Yes. Okay. Did you find then overall that the experiment that you did here, the file of investigation, was consistent with what was found in Mr. Luisma's phone as two separate trips back and forth from the parking lot to where Melody's body was found that were nine minutes apart? Yes. I think while we're accessing another exhibit here, I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, did you collect some items of evidence or you and other officers at the Marion Police Department and um, transport those evidence to the Division of Criminal Investigations Laboratory for further testing? That's correct. What was the purpose of doing that? Uh, the items were sent to the laboratory for fingerprint and DNA analysis. And as a result of that, uh, did you receive some results from the DNA forensic analysis? We did. We've got a witness coming in, I think, today to talk about that. But let's talk about the fingerprint analysis that you asked for. What were, specifically were you asking as far as fingerprint analysis? Uh, for the specific items that uh, were returned recently, um, it was, I believe, the three machetes, a lift that was taken off of the defendant's car, um, and, uh, and another knife that was recovered at Dakota Van Patten's house. Um, the DCI lab um, couldn't get to those items in time for the trial. They were updating their system, and they um, informed us that they would, they would not be able to provide the results of those items to us. So I contacted the Cedar Rapids Police Department. They have a fingerprint identification individual that can perform those duties for us and did so. And with regard to, uh, did the DCI, were they able to do testing on any of the items of, that were submitted for fingerprints? On some, on some items, yes, but not, not this uh, later set that we sent. I believe it was August, the time frame. There was multiple sets of um, evidence that we sent to the DCI lab based on um, what we thought was a priority at a time. Do you recall the results of the fingerprint examination that was done by the DCI on any of the items? Not right now. Now I think we have State's Exhibit 1A ready to uh, publish again to the jury. Publishing 1A. You see State's Exhibit 1A, Sergeant Peterson? I do. Okay. And does this show, based upon your investigation, 
uh, relative route that was taken by um, Mr. Wiesma and Mr. Van Patten from Lily Pond, um, ultimately to 690 Bentley Drive where Taya Meyer, Meyer lives and then ultimately to um, Hummingbird Lane in Hiawatha where Mr. Luisma lives? Yes. We, we had some testimony and exhibits earlier in this case, I believe yesterday, that showed some surveillance footage of Mr. Luisma's vehicle on Edgewood Road. Do you recall uh, that being part of the investigation? I do. And is, what can you tell us about um, Edgewood Road in Cedar Rapids? Is that a, a, a primarily a commercial, a residential road? It's primarily commercial. Um, it's, I would say it's one of the um, main arteries on the west side of the city. And are there a lot of businesses on Edgewood Road? There are. Are there uh, businesses like convenience stores and whatnot that are open 24 hours a day? To my knowledge, yes. Okay. Are you familiar with the location of the Cedar Rapids Police Department? I am. Where is that? It's on 1st Street in the 500 block. Are you able to... Down in this general area. We're going to go ahead and try to, without losing our <coughs> clarity here. Okay. Right about there. Okay. So, um, that in the downtown area of Cedar Rapids? It is. Okay. Is the Cedar Rapids Police Department accessible via various um, roads uh, from Edgewood Road? Yes. Cedar Rapids? Okay. You familiar with um, 16th Avenue? 16th Southwest? Avenue, yes. Okay. Can downtown be accessed from Edgewood Road by 16th Avenue? Yes. Familiar with Johnson Avenue? Yes. Okay. Is, can downtown be accessed by Johnson Avenue? Yes. Familiar with 1st Avenue? I am. And does 1st Avenue go into downtown? It does. Do you know where the Hiawatha Police Department is? I do. Okay. What's the location of the Hiawatha Police Department? Uh, I don't know the exact address. It is um, off of Center Point Road and Blairs Ferry Road. Uh, it is to the northwest of that intersection. Um, uh, that's, thank you. <laughs> The Hiawatha uh, Police Department is actually attached to their city hall, and city hall is um, on North Center Point Road in Hiawatha. Um, it butts up to North Center Point Road, and it is only a couple blocks away from Blairs Ferry to the north in this general area. So if you're traveling Edgewood to, to Highway 100, when you're on Highway 100, would you just need to go north to the Hiawatha Police Department? You could take 380 north, or you could actually get off at the Center Point Road exit and travel northbound towards uh, the Hiawatha Police Department, which is in this general area right here. And is it also uh, accessible off of Blairs Ferry Road? Yes, you'd have to take North Center Point Road to from Blairs Ferry, yes. Can you see the Hiawatha Police Department from the interstate? I'm not sure. Okay. Is it pretty close to the interstate? It, it is close to the, to the interstate. I'm not sure if you can visit, if there's line of sight to it, but it's very close to the interstate. Okay. All right, we can go ahead and take that down now. Overall, uh, did path of travel that you found that Mr. Luisma's uh, vehicle took from Lily Pond to Taya Meyer's house and then back to his house afford multiple opportunities for him to uh, 
travel to the police departments of Cedar Rapids, Hiawatha, even Marion? Yes. Where's Marion Police Department? 6315 Highway 151 uh, for a general location. That'd be the intersection of Highway 13 and 151. We're just slightly east of that. How far is that from uh, 690 Bentley Drive? It's, it's several miles. It's approximately a 10 minute drive from our police department to um, the Bentley Drive complex. All right, um, now I'd like to um, ask you a few questions um, here about the um, investigation you did into Mr. Luisma's phone. Okay. okay. So um, did you actually access Mr. Luisma's phone manually when you um, uh, were able to recover it? I think it was from Nakia and Patty, but ended up with you all. Yes. And through that process, were you able to um, manipulate the phone to get into Mr. Luisma's the apps on his phone? Yes. And with one of the apps that you were able to get into the uh, Facebook app? Yes. And when you went into the Facebook app, were you um, then, did you discover that you had accessed a Facebook profile belonging to McKinley Luisma? Actually, it was through Facebook Messenger, not uh, Facebook itself. Okay. So uh, did you access the Facebook Messenger app? Yes. And when you did that, were you able to determine that you were indeed accessing a Facebook Messenger app that was connected to Mr. Luisma's Facebook account? Yes. And so you knew at that point in time you were in Mr. Luisma's Facebook Messenger app? That's correct. Connected to his account? Correct. And uh, when you did that, were you able to access some conversations between the Facebook um, account of Mr. Luisma and other individuals? Yes. And was one of those individuals that you accessed that Mr. Luisma had conversed with Melody Hoffman. That's correct. And uh, were you able then to tap or enter into the Facebook Messenger uh, conversation um, and, and observe conversations between um, McKinley Luisma's Facebook account and Melody Hoffman? Yes. And I'd just like to present as a um, matter of identification, States Exhibit Number 17. To the witness, Your Honor. You see that? I do. Okay. Is uh, to your knowledge, does this contain then a recording that you made of? you uh, manually navigating the conversation between Mr. Luisma's um, Facebook account, known Facebook account, and Melody Hoffman. Yes. Move to enter states exhibit 17BB, Your Honor. Any objection to 17BB? Yes, Your Honor, we object. Objections overruled for the reasons previously discussed. 17BB is admitted. And permission to publish in play states exhibit 17BB, Your Honor. 17BB is uh, published now. Go ahead and start it now. So when is the last um, message exchange between um, Melody Hoffman and the defendant? On January 28th, 2024 at approximately 3.35 p.m. And that just appears to be um, a question by Ms. Hoffman, what do you want, is that? that that's correct. And how does Mr. Leesma's uh, well, Facebook account belonging to Mr. Leesma respond to that? Nothing. Okay, I'm glad you continue that. Okay, now we're gonna start at the beginning here, we can pause. Um, does this indicate then at the very top that um, the person with whom um, McKinley Louisman's Facebook account is is communicating on Messenger is Melody Hoffman. That's correct. And does this indicate, at least at the time this conversation was accessed, that he was not friends with Melody Hoffman on Facebook? That's correct. When, when does this particular conversation uh, commence? 
On January 26, 2024, at 7.39 p.m. Okay. And what's the first entry there? Three question marks coming from uh, the defendant's profile. Okay. And then when is the next entry? Uh, same date, but at 7.42 p.m., and it's a video chat for two minutes. What does that indicate, a video chat? Um, FaceTime, so if uh, you can you can view each other and just talk to each other. It's like a phone call, but you're video talking or video chatting with each other so you can see each other. So does that indicate that there was a video chat or conversation between uh, Melly Hoffman's Facebook Messenger uh, and becoming Wiesma's Facebook Messenger on January 26th at... 7.42 p.m.? Yes. And then what's what's the entry after that? It says, you sent, unsent a message. Okay. And that means, uh, does that mean a message was unsent by Mr. Louisman's Facebook account? Correct. Okay. And then after that is what next? There's an audio call that uh, was missed. Okay. Does that show, can you tell whether that shows an audio call made by uh, Melody Hoffman or by Mr. Louisman's account? I believe that the, uh, it had been from the defendant's account making that call. If it's on the other side of the screen, it should be uh, Melody calling in. And so what's the next entry here? It says, why are you calling me, my, or why are you calling my name like that for, question mark, question mark, uh, BC, probably because you mad he is with me, question mark, question mark. And that's coming from McKinley Louisma's Facebook That's messenger. correct. Go ahead and continue here. Of course. Okay, we'll stop again here. And then after that um, question from uh, McKinley Wiesma's Facebook Messenger account, what's the next entry? It's at 7.50 on the same date. It's a missed video call. And who can you tell that missed video call is coming from? Uh, Melody's account. Okay. And then... Um, after that, there's a couple entries, and who are those from? Those are from Melody. Okay, and what is what is the what do these entries say? I don't want. I'm, I think what W D Y M stands for is what do you mean? Why am I calling your name like that? Uh, the next entry is A. You poly, meaning probably don't even care about me anymore. B. You don't want to be around me. Because BC or because you know that I am your, or I know you're with Kia, BC because you uh, keep going back and forth between her and me. Then we have the beginning of the next message, but we'll see if we can scroll up a little bit more here. And the next message following that is now you're ignoring me for no darn reason. And then there, what's the response to what Melody Hoffman says there? It's an emoji with uh, sunglasses and a smiling face. Okay. And then what's the next uh, entries we see here? Uh, continuing on the, the 26th, uh, it starts at 7.58 p.m. There's an audio call for one minute from Melody, and then the next entry is again from Melody for 31 seconds. Um, the next one is a missed audio call, and then it continues to 8.01 p.m. with a two-minute audio call from Melody to the defendant's profile. So all of those calls are from Melody's profile to the McKinley Louisma's Facebook Messenger profile? Correct. And then after that audio call, it's two minutes on January 26th at 8.01 p.m., what do we see as the, the next message is sent? Ken WTF. I think we all know what WTF means, but go ahead for the record. For the record? Yeah. What the fuck? And so after that WTF, what do we see as the next um, two entries there? There's an audio call for 45 seconds and then another missed audio call, uh, or video call, excuse me, from Melody. And then the next entry we see is at January 26 at 8.05 p.m. What does that say? It's an audio call for two minutes from Melody. And then after that audio call for two minutes, what's the next uh, um, statement by Melody? It says, tell him I'm done with his goofy ass. And we have a response here um, from Mr. Louisma's Facebook account. What does that say? It says, why, how come, or how come you be done with someone that was already done with you? 
crying, laughing, emoji face six times, make it um, make sense. In response to that, um, for, that came from Mr. Luisma's Facebook uh, profile. How did Melody respond to that? Uh, and it says, and if he wants to come back to me, he will have to talk to my mom about it. After Melody stated that, what was the response from Mr. Luisma's Facebook account? Nope. And then how does Melody respond? Okay, then. What's the next entry? Uh, there's an audio call from uh, the defendant's profile for five seconds. After that five-second audio call, um, what's the next response that, or statement that Melody makes? Don't even think to come to my crib or my grandparents because, or BC, your ass will be in jail. After that, there's a missed audio call. Uh, following the audio call, it states, I don't even want to be around you because you do too much. Okay, then scrolling further here, um, at the bottom of, there you go, starting with buy, what's it say there? Starting with what, I'm sorry. Uh, buy, have fun. No. Buy, have fun with Kia's ass because I'm done with your bullshit. Adios, from, amigos. And that's from Melody, too? That's correct. Okay. And then at the bottom of this, it says, you blocked Melody. What does that mean? Uh, that the user for the profile had blocked Melody's profile, um, allowing no more conversation to come back and forth between the two of them, unless they initiated, I believe. So after those entries on January, I think that was January 26th we were looking at, is that right? That's correct. Okay, on January 27th, what do we see? We had a missed call um, at 11.05 p.m. on the 27th. So after all those entries on the January 26th and after Melody said adios amigos, there's another call. Is that, in, who, who made that call? It came from the defendant's profile. And how did Melody respond to that? Uh, the following day at 3.35 in the afternoon, uh, she says, what do you want with an emoji face that's got the um, line for a mouth. And then the defense response to that? Nothing. Okay. I think that's it for the exhibit. And so that conversation then was what you found from uh, looking at the defendant's phone as far as contact between his Facebook account and Melody's Facebook account through Messenger. That's correct. Sergeant Peterson, we've talked about a lot here over the last couple of days now. I think I've reached the point where I, um, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Cross. Thank you. Good morning, Sergeant. Good morning. If the amount of time that you've been testifying correlates to your importance in the case, it would seem that you played a very important role in this case. Would I you appreciate agree? I appreciate that, and I agree. You did a lot of work, didn't you? I did. You did a lot of work yourself, correct? That's correct. And you kept apprised of what other agencies and officers were doing on the case as well, correct? That's correct. You've been able to testify in some cases to your DCI testing that's been done on this case, right? Correct. And so you followed it all along, would you agree? Yes. You've done a lot of work on various cell phones, right? Yes. And it seems like you've got some special training in cell phones as well? No special formalized training. Um, as I think I noted earlier in my testimony, uh, we had an evidence tech that was certified with Cellbrite. And through uh, the last three years, she's kind of shown me how to manipulate the program so I can identify things that are important in a case uh, to a, help her workload to be less. And sometimes our techs don't uh, know everything about our cases. So it's nice to be able to go through cases and look for items that you might not, they might not recognize or they're not directly involved in the case otherwise. In short, Sergeant, you know the evidence in this case, don't you? Yes. Which means you know that on February 17th, Dakota Van Patten had a gun. It was a BB gun. Right. You know that Dakota Van Patten 
had a BB gun, correct? Yep. In all the work you've done in this case, you actually saw a Snapchat video of his showing it, didn't you? That's correct. It was as a waistband. You saw a picture of Dakota Van Patten with a BB gun in his waistband the night of February 17th, correct? That's correct. Now, you've made a point to tell us that it was a BB gun, correct? That's correct. But we've talked about this gun before, and you yourself admitted that it looked real. It does look real. <clears throat> Having seen this picture of Dakota with a gun, can you demonstrate for the jury how that gun was positioned? Do you mind if I stand up? Probably easier. May he judge? You may. And I will ask you, sir, if you wouldn't mind for our record, as you are physically demonstrating, could you do your best to explain what you are doing verbally for our court reporter? Of course. Thank you. So the, if I recall correctly, the gun is in, this is the pistol, and it's in his waistband down in this kind of motion. It is, at, would be called an appendix carry. Part of the gun is sticking out, the handle is sticking out, with the pistol being inside his waistband, or the barrel being inside his waistband. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Slaughter, would you be so kind as to show Exhibit 13BB? It's been offered and admitted. GG. I'm sorry. Thank you. Tell me when you're ready. Publishing 13 GG. You had a chance to look at that? Yes. You recognize that? I do. You recognize that because it's the gun that was in the waistband of Dakota Van Patten's clothes? That's correct. One more question with respect to Dakota's phone. You talked at length about your investigation into the health data in my client's phone, correct? That's correct. Did you do the same thing with Dakota Van Patten's health data? I don't believe that Android collects health data. That would be a question for Officer Jeff Holst. I never received any kind of information like that from the download that he provided. Okay. To be fair, it sounds like you were not asked to do that. That's correct. Thank you. The one other thing I want to visit with you about, Sergeant, is that paracord that we spent some time talking about. You recall that yesterday? Yes. You testified that you just happened to be shopping at Menards when it caught your eye, correct? That's correct. And it caught your eye because it was similar looking to the paracord you'd seen in this case, correct? That's correct. You told us that you noted the length of it, correct? That's correct. Was it 50 feet? The store-bought brand, yes, is 50 feet. And the picture that you showed had it kind of in a bin full of other paracord, is that right? That's correct. Do you recall if that particular color of paracord was available in any other sizes? I didn't look. I just saw the green one that looked like the exact same one that was recovered out of your defendant's trunk. That's what caught my eye. And you're not saying that that Menards is the only place where you can buy that paracord, correct? That's correct. And Ms. Slaughter, may I ask you to show one more photo? 13M, Judge Mishy. All right. And so now we've published and you're able to see 13M, correct? I am. And you're familiar with this paracord? Yes. It was found in the basement of Dakota Van Patten's house? That's correct. 
Is it bundled in a similar way to the bundles that you saw at Menards? I would say so. Sergeant, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Redirect. Would you get that picture back up, 13 M? Okay, Sergeant Peterson, um, we're looking again at Stacey exhibit number 13 M, the paracord in Mr. Van Patten's basement that you identified as being similar to the one you saw at Menards and that you did all the uh, measurements on, right? That's correct. You remember, uh, you and Special Agent Kelly talking to Mr. Luisma during the interview about his um, his activities preceding the night of February 17th? Yes. And did you and, and Special Agent Kelly ask him about uh, whether he went to Menards that week? I don't believe we asked about Menards specifically. Yeah. I'd have to refer to the, the video in the interview, but I don't recall it right now. And maybe we'll ask Special Agent Kelly about that, but... Um, in the items recovered in the trunk, to your recollection, was there any um, receipts that were recovered from Menards? There was one receipt from Menards. Okay. And do you remember what that indicated was purchased? Uh, it was a door lock. What's next to the paracord right here? That is a um, door lock or a deadbolt for a key to entry, so a door lock. And as a part of the investigation in this case, um, are you also aware of a um, um, shopping trip that Mr. Luisma made to uh, Walmart um, before that final trip with the machetes and whatnot as well? Yes. And you remember what he purchased at that time? It was a similar looking uh, deadbolt as well at Walmart. And early in your testimony, you recall talking about um, the door at Mr. Van Patten's house? Yes. And you remember what was inside the door? It was a green rope fashioned into a door handle. Okay. And um, was that door missing um, any kind of door lock or deadbolt function? I don't think there was a, a doorknob to speak of. It just had the paracord through it, is that right? Correct. Okay. We can take that down. And now I'd like to um, show you pictures We'd like to publish for the, the jury again what's been previously introduced and into evidence in State's Exhibit 13V. Do you see what's in State's Exhibit number 13V? I do. Okay. Is that um, a photograph that was taken of the uh, gun that was recovered in the locked box? Um, under the Mr. Van Patten's brother, Dustin Prince, bed during the search warrant? Yes. And to your knowledge, what kind of gun is this? It's a 9 millimeter. Okay. Does this represent um, the, uh, or does this uh, appear to be a similar appearance to the gun that you and Miss Iberman were discussing that was the BB gun? Okay. No, this is a different gun. Okay. And is, is this a uh, similar appearance at all to the gun that was witnessed in this Snapchat picture with Dakota Van Patten? No, the one that uh, defendant Van Patten had is a 1911 style uh, pistol. This is, it see, appears to be a subcompact type of pistol. Okay, thanks, we can take that down. Your archive, one second.
present to the witness, Your Honor, what's been previously marked as State's Exhibit 17O through 17S for identification purposes. Scanning through those, do you recognize these photos? I do. Are these uh, photographs that you took? Yes, they are. What are these photographs of? They're the handle of a machete that uh, was purchased at Walmart by our department for a comparison to the machetes that were recovered in this case. Is this machete um, the exact same similar model as the ones that were purchased by um, Defendant Louisma, Mr. Van Patten, and Mr. Kempton on February 17th of 2024, as we've seen in the exhibits? Yes, it's an Ozark Trail machete that Walmart sells. And what area of the machete did you photograph? The handle. Are these fair and accurate depictions of the um, machete that you photographed, the handle area? Yes, it is. Move to enter states 17O through 17S. Any objection to 17O through 17S? No, no. 17O through 17S are admitted. Permission to publish those, Your Honor? Publishing now. Can you tell us first what we're looking at in States Exhibit 17O? This is the, the handle portion of the machete um, laying on a, a scale within our uh, forensic lab. We have a camera that uh, we'll use for more uh, detailed photographing. And what does this show as far as the handle and uh, kind of the appearance of it and makeup of it? Uh, most notably, there's um, small rectangles within the whole handle itself. There's also three, well, a total of four, what would appear to be rivets um, that are golden color, and then also a hole that um, would probably be used for placing a rope to carry it or something like that. And then also there's a, I would call it a tang on the end of the handle itself with a rivet at the end of it. Are those small rectangular Describe it. Uh, op, what we see here, the small rectangular um, shapes, are those raised from the machete yes. itself? They are raised up. Is that um, basically intended to be a way to, to grip the machete without it slipping out of your hand? That's correct. Okay. Move on to 17 uh, P. And what's depicted there? This is a closer picture of the same handle um, near that hole where you possibly put a rope with the, the rivets um, with a sticker with um, a measurement, a metric unit uh, measurement to do a comparison of the size of those, um, those raised um, uh, squares or rectangles, if you will. Does this give us an idea of um, how far apart those raised rectangles are on the grip of the machete? Yes. And what does that indicate? It just indicates the uh, pattern that they uh, is imprinted on the handle itself. As far as the measured distance between those raised rectangular um, uh, objects on the um, grip, how, how far apart are those from each other? They're about a meter or a centimeter. Okay. Moving on to 17Q. What does this show? I apologize, not a centimeter, but it'd be a millimeter for each one of those little tiny rectangles. The, the unit itself is, um, you'll see the one and the two, that's centimeters, and then obviously down to um, the tenths. Sorry, repeat your question. Thank you for clarifying that. What are we seeing in 17Q? Uh, this is just another uh, close-up photo of the bottom part of um, the handle of the machete that includes that tang. And what are we seeing then? And uh, we'll move on to 17R. This is an even closer photo of the bottom of the handle, um, excluding the, the tang as it goes off to the, the bottom right here. And then again, for the, I would call it the rope, uh, the hole for the rope. This is, I mean, basically what you're showing here is that we're getting closer and closer to get an idea what these little rectangular shapes are and how they appear. Yes. Moving on then finally to 17S, what are we looking at here? Even closer picture with the one rivet and the, the hole for possibly a rope. 
And so what we're seeing here as we get closer is that these uh, rectangular shapes really do appear to be about a millimeter apart. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. I think that's all I have for the exhibits. Is that some follow-up investigation you, you did then in this case to take those close-up pictures that machete handle? I did. That's all I have. Thanks, Judge. Cross? No, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to be in recess for our lunch break um, until 1.30.